So today's topic is, is kind of a fun one. It's uh, focusing on a class called Java Future Task. And we'll talk about what a future task is. It's a little bit odd of a class. And it's basically used to convey the result from the thread that ex is executing a computation to one or more threads that are waiting to get the result. And I'll explain why you would ever want to do this. And I'll give you a very interesting example of something called the Memoizer class, which uses future task to speed up programs by caching the results of expensive function calls and then returning these cached results when the same input occurs again. So this is actually uh, kind of a follow on. The example here connects to some discussions we had actually a while back related to the executor service. And so this will continue on with some interesting implementation artifacts related to that. So first of all, what the heck is a future task? So as I mentioned before, it's basically a way to get a result from a thread that executes a computation, so the thing that's doing the work, to one or more threads that are trying to get the result. So it's really a combination of things. As the name suggests, it's both a future, so it's something that you can wait on uh, for completion, and it's also a task, something that runs and, and does its job to do computation. So it's, it's a combination of things. Because it's a combination, it implements and extends various capabilities. It implements something called a runnable future. And runnable future is an interface that also implements the future interface. So you can see here that a future task implements runnable future. And runnable future, in turn, implements future. And so e each of these things adds a little bit more to the, to the puzzle. So we get the methods to do future operations here. Then runnable future inherits those future operations and adds a run method. And then future task in implements that. So it'll fill in run and get and so on. And it adds a few other things. Here are the things you can do with a future task. You can start and cancel a computation that runs asynchronously. And you would typically do this using the executor service, using a thread pool that comes out of the executor service. That's usually what's used to execute a future task. And I'll show you an example of that shortly. You can also, because it's a future, you can also check to see if it's completed or had been canceled. So let's get some of the methods from this. Um, so these are the methods. You can basically run it. Once it's, once it's put into a thread pool, it gets run because it's essentially a runnable. And you can also cancel it because it's a future. You can check to see if it's been canceled or if it's completed. And then you can also get the results of the computation. So as you can see, it's got these future-like mechanisms. And then it's also got this run method to actually do some work. Here are the key methods in future task. It's, it's one of these weird abstractions in some sense that even if someone explains to you what it does, it doesn't really make sense until you see an example of how it actually works. So I'll, of course, show you an example here shortly. So the, the future task constructor actually does something quite interesting. What it does is it takes a callable. And if you may recall, a callable is basically this abstraction that's used to the callable is used to have a two-way call where you give it um, something to do and it returns a value. So it's basically a kind of a you can use it as a lambda expression actually or a method reference if you want to. So this thing is going to get tucked away and then will be used later when the run method gets called. So when the run method gets called, this is the thing that's going to be running in the background. That will turn around and forward to the call method on the callable. So this is just giving it some work to do when it's run. And uh, it'll also set the result of the computation unless it's been canceled. So run will also have this side effect. You can check to see whether the task is finished normally or whether it was canceled. You can cancel it, and you can get the results. There's both timed and untimed get operations. And then there's also this interesting hook method, which you can see is, is protected. So these, all these methods here are ones that you get out of the box. But then there's also a method called done. And this is protected. By default, it's, 
a no-op, so you don't have to override it. But if you choose to override it, you can invoke some kind of completion callback or perform some kind of bookkeeping operation to do something as a side effect. Just as a simple note, we'll talk later about the executor completion service, and it uses future tasks to take the results of the computation when they finish and stick them into a queue called the completion queue. All right, so that's basically the interface. It, if you're like me, you, you listen to this interface, and you're like, what the heck does this thing do? So in order to make it concrete and tangible, I'm going to give you an example of where it can be used. And I'm going to motivate this example with another abstraction that's quite interesting called a memoizer. Uh, and actually, this is a fun, it's a really funny term. You should, if you've never heard the term memoization, you should take a look at the Wikipedia link because it gives more detail. But basically what it is, memoization is a technique, it's an optimization technique that's used to speed up programs by caching the results of expensive function calls, things that take a long time to run, and then simply returning the cached results when the same inputs occur again. So rather than having to recompute something every time, what you do is you memoize it. So it's memoized. Someone once said that memoize sounds like Elmer Fudd saying memorize. And uh, in fact, if you read the book uh, Java Concurrency in Practice by, by um, a variety of people, in, including um, Brian Getz and Doug Lee and so on, they have this memoizer thing we're going to talk about. But whoever did the copy editing of the book got confused and called it the memorizer, which it really isn't. It's a memoizer. But that's an easy thing to make a mistake. So here's the class we're going to look at. This is the memoizer class. And what it does is it defines a memoizing cache that maps a key to the value produced by a function. And this, this implementation is based on the Java concurrency and practice book, but it spells the, the name correctly. So we'll see here that the memoizer works as follows. When you call the apply method, it will first check to see if you've already computed the value for this key. And if so, it just returns that. Otherwise, it goes ahead and computes the value and stores it in a map. And we'll talk more about that in a second. The con a concurrent hash map is used internally to minimize synchronization overhead. So just take a step back and think about what we're trying to do here for a second. We're trying to divine, define a memoizer cache that multiple threads of control can use concurrently to check to see whether or not an expensive computation has already been performed. If so, you'll get the result back. Otherwise, we perform that computation and store it in the map. So that's the semantics of what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that this works correctly and efficiently in a multi-threaded use case. And I'll, I'll give you a better example of the use case in a second. The main function that's doing all the heavy lifting here is something called compute value. And what it's going to use, it's going to use a future task, as we'll describe in a second. And the future task is used to ensure only one call to the expensive function is actually run when a key and a value are first added to the memoizing cache. It still may not make sense why this is a big deal, but I'll, I'll keep going. It'll make more sense. And here's the use case that helps to motivate this. So let's say we have a pool of threads which are doing things that are expensive to compute. Um, but obviously, if they've been computed already, we just look up the results. So what it's going to happen here is we might have a bunch of threads that are all accessing the memoizer simultaneously. And let's say, for sake of argument, that they've got a prime number uh, that they're looking up to see, or that, sorry, they have a number that's a prime candidate, and they're looking up that prime candidate to see if it's a prime number. So as you can see here, I've got a bunch of simultaneous calls going. Um, for sake of argument, let's say that there's two prime candidates, PC1 and PC2. Just imagine some big number that we want to check for its primeness. And for various reasons, three of these threads are simultaneously checking to see if PC1 has been computed already. And some other thread or threads is checking something else. But the key thing here is that there's three threads simultaneously checking if PC1 is prime. And the way we, we want this to work is we want to make sure that only one 
actual computation, one expensive computation, will be run for all of these three threads, or n threads. So, so if n threads all come in at the, exactly the same time, we want to make sure that only one of them actually performs the expensive computation. And the others are going to wait for that expensive computation to be finished, and then they will take the results of the value. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to make sure that only one computation takes place. OK, so that's where future task comes in. So I'll show you how we can do this. We want to make sure that this computation only runs once. And here's the implementation. You can take a look at it at this link. If you were to click on this link, it would take you to the example code that I'm going to walk through. All right, so first of all, Memoizer implements function, which means we can use it anywhere you expect a function to be used. We have a concurrent map, which is implemented as concurrent hash map. And this associates a key with a value that's produced by this expensive function. We're going to have the map map key to future, which is really kind of funky. And the reason for doing this is to ensure that this expensive function is only called once. And again, it may not make sense yet, but it will in a second. Here's the function. This is the expensive function that's going to produce a value based on a key that it's given. And here's the constructor, which will initialize this function field. So we give it a function to run. And for the purposes of our discussion, this function will typically be a, uh, it's typically going to be a lambda expression of some kind. Here's the apply method. Remember, because this thing is a function, it has to have an apply method. And that's the method that's going to get called. It's the highest level method because it's a function. So when you have an instance of Memoizer and you apply it, then this is the method that gets called. And what this is going to do is, at a high level, this apply method is going to return the value that's associated with the key and the cache. That's the high level view. This is what it does under the hood. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to use the concurrent hash map to find the key in the, cache, in the cache. So remember how concurrent hash map works. Concurrent hash map works by having really efficient synchronization. It's a concurrent collection. And so if multiple threads all come in at the same time, and you call get the concurrent hash map, make sure that the data structures are properly synchronized internally for the concurrent hash map. So it'll be a safe operation from a thread correctness point of view. Now, what we're going to look up here is actually kind of interesting. We're actually not looking up the value associated with the key, per se. We're looking up a future to the value associated with the key. And of course, that's because the mcache was a key to future of type value mapping, not a key to value mapping, or directly. It's, the value is the future. OK, so one of two things will happen here. Uh, if we do a get and the key has already been computed, then we're going to get back a non-null future, because it's already in the map. However, if we look something up in the cache and it hasn't been computed yet, we're going to get back a null future. So if we get back a null future, it says, this value has not yet been computed. So what we're going to do then is we're going to compute the value. And that will give back a future. And then we're going to go ahead and get the value of the future. And we'll talk more about both of these methods in a second. Compute value is the really interesting one. Get future value, when you look at it, it's very simple. It just does a get call on the, on the future. And if the future has been computed, we get the result right away. If the future has not finished being computed, if the computation of the future is a future to has not yet finished being computed, that will block. So it'll return the value in either case, but it may have to block until the computation finishes. OK, so far so good. That's the high level view. The main point to take away here is if this is the first time we've tried to find this key, we're going to compute the value. And that will run a function, which was passed in here, in order to do that computation. So here's where things get really interesting. So this is the compute value method. And compute value takes a key and returns a future to the value associated with that. And its purpose is to compute the value associated with the key, and it'll return a future to this thing when it's done. 
So the first thing we do is we go ahead and we make ourselves a new instance of future task. And this is cool for a variety of reasons. First of all, we're making a future task, but we're also passing it a lambda expression. But first, let's talk about what a future task is. The future task is going to be this object that when, uh, when its run method is called, it will forward to the callable lambda function that we passed in here. So this future task expects to get a callable. We're passing in a function lambda, which works fine for a callable in this case. And in this particular case, we're going to tell the function to apply itself for this key. So this is going to go ahead and, and do some computation involving the key. For the purposes of our later use case, it's going to do prime number checking. But that's not important at this point. It's just some computation. And it's fairly expensive. That's the other point. This could take a while to run. OK, so now we have a new future task. A couple of really interesting things are going to happen at this point. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use a very special method, which I alluded to before when we talked about concurrent hash maps. And I talked about something called put if absent. And what put if absent does is it's an atomic check then act method. And so what it'll do is it will try to add the future task, this object we just created, to the map as the value that's associated with the key. And the way put if absent works is if the future task is not already there, it will go ahead and atomically insert it into the map. And then it'll go ahead and return the value. If there is already a future task associated with that key, then it'll just return what's in the map already. But this takes place atomically. So put if absent is an atomic check and act operation, and you don't have to worry about race conditions. It takes care of that stuff internally. Now, the use case that we're trying to, uh, the reason we're trying to do this is it might turn out that multiple threads simultaneously came into this apply method, and they simultaneously tried to get some key, and that key had not yet been computed. So simultaneously, multiple threads are going to go ahead and call compute value. So it might be the case that you know on the first time in, if our timing is a little bit wonky, multiple threads, let's say three threads or two threads for sake of argument, all try to get the same key. They all find it to be null. They all call compute value. And so what they'll do at this point is they will, uh, all three of those threads would make a future task with the same function to apply. But then when we call put if absent, only one thread will end up being able to put something into the cache, and the other threads will simply get the results of whichever thread put it in first. So one will actually add it if it's absent, and the others will look it up. So by the time we get done with this call, irrespective of which thread got there first, then we've got each of those threads would have their own copy of the reference to the future. Now here's the interesting part. If the future does not equal null, then we return the future. So what's going to happen here is if the future does not equal null, the value was already in the cache. So we'll just go ahead and return it. However, the first time in, the first time we put something in the, in the uh, cache, there was nothing there. So it's going to return null. So one of the threads, and it doesn't really matter which one, one of the threads will get future equal null. All the other ones are going to get future not equal null, so they'll return the future. So if future equal null, then that means that the key has just been added since it's the first time in, or the first thread in, or the first call. So that indicates the computation has not been done yet. This is really funky. So only one thread, in other words, the first one that comes in here, should encounter future equal null. When that occurs, that thread calls future task dot run. And what future task dot run does is it forwards to m function apply key, which is what we had given to the future task up here. So when we, when we call run here, 
that forwards to the parameter passed to the future task. And that will then perform this long-running computation. And it'll basically have the side effect, in this case, of storing the result into uh, the map when it's finished. We then return a future to this future task that's just completed. And the reason we know it completed is we just ran it. So this thread, the first thread in, will actually do the computation. And when it's done, it'll return a future to a completed task. OK. Now here's the other piece of the puzzle. This is get future value. If you go back over here, you'll see that that's the last thing that gets called. So all the threads will come through and call get future value. The threads that came through here that got a future because it was in the map, but aren't the one, aren't the thread who's doing the computation of the function, those threads will come here into get future value and they will call future.get. But at this point, the future will block because the computation hasn't finished. So any threads that aren't the first thread in will block waiting on the future for the computation that's being called by the first thread in to finish running. And so the first thread in, because it's the one that will have run the computation and returned a future that's completed, that thread, when it calls future.get, will just whiz right through, because it's completed the future at that point. The other threads Will who came through at the same time will be blocking, waiting for the first thread in to finish the computation. So in other words, they won't proceed, they won't continue until the computation is done. And so the cool thing about this particular way of doing things is that this expensive computation will be called only once, no matter how many threads come through the memoizer apply method at the same time. And so you're basically minimizing locking overhead. You're just locking really on the first one in order to block it. And then, I'm uh, oh, sorry, the other one's going to block. It's going to do its computation. But the computation only gets done once. So this, this actually turns out to be a very tricky problem without using these mechanisms. So here's how we actually use this stuff to kind of pull it all together. So there's, uh, as you can see, we have a function that's the base interface or the super interface of the memoizer. And that allows us to be able to pass a memoizer any place you expect to have a function. Here's how this actually gets used. This is from the prime executor service example, which again, if you click on this, you'll find the code. And this is the prime callable method. This is part of a program that's checking a bunch of random numbers to see if they're prime or not. And so prime callable implements the callable interface, so it's going to have a call hook method, and it's going to have a prime result, which is just something that keeps track of uh, the prime candidate and whether or not what the prime factors are. We keep this thing called prime checker, and prime checker is a function, which of course will be a memoizer in our use case. But the prime checker is the function that gets stored in the constructor, and we're going to use that to do the check. And then when the call method gets made, which will always be done in a, in a thread in the background, in a pool thread, that's going to make a new prime result, which is going to have the prime candidate and the result of applying the prime checker on the prime candidate. And this is, of course, the one that's the interesting one, because this is the one that's going to be the memoizer, as we're going to see in a second. So it will either just return the the value associated with that key, if we've already done the computation, that's the fast path. Or it'll go ahead and do the computation. And prime result is just a tuple that matches the prime number candidate with the result. And we need that so we can figure out how to handle it when we print the result to the user. All right, here's the actual body of the code that uses all this stuff. This is in main activity. And it has a method called start computations. And what start computations does is it creates a bunch of random numbers, count random numbers between 0 and some max value. This is a stream, so it'll take those random values. It'll map each of those values 
Each random number will be mapped to a prime callable, which is the thing we just got done looking at here. So it's got a call method on it. And that prime callable is passed two parameters. One is the number that we want to check, and the other is the prime memoizer. So we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Here is the prime memoizer. The prime memoizer, as you can see, is a function that maps long to long. And it is a, a memoizer, the class we just created. And we pass in the function. In this case, we pass in the brute force prime checker, which is this somewhat inefficient method for checking if something's prime. And the reason we use it inefficiently is so we want to burn up a lot of CPU time. So we only want to run it one time for each prime number candidate we give it. The memoizer transparently caches the results of prime checking and then returns them if they've already been computed, so you don't have to do the computations more than once. And the most important thing is we only do the computation once. And that's because we've used this clever memoization technique with the future task. Then we're going to go ahead and take that stream of prime callables, and we're going to submit them to the executor service so that things can run concurrently in the background thread, in the pool of background threads. And then we collect everything up into a list. These are a bunch of futures that will be collected here. And of course, if you recall streams, the collect method will start all these intermediate operations running. And it'll do the computations, create a list of future results, and pass them back. So that explains why we were so concerned about making sure that our memoizer only did that computation once, even if it was called simultaneously from multiple threads, because the way we wrote this program is that all these many different random numbers will all be run concurrently in a pool of threads. So there's no reason why we couldn't have multiple prime numbers that are all being checked in the memoized cache at the same time. So we have to guard against this and make sure we only create the, the object, do the computation one time. Uh, by the way, I want to mention something real quick. So uh, we've only touched a bit on things like streams in this class. I'll be teaching a class next fall, which is also oddly given the same number, 391 or 891. And uh, it's got a different title. It's something like Introduction to uh, Concurrent and Parallel Programming with Java and Android or something like that. And in that class, we will go into much more detail about things like uh, streams, parallel streams, completable futures, the fork join task, all this other stuff that we touched on lightly in this class, but we'll go into it in much more detail. So if you're, if you're not a senior and you're not going off to join the real world next year, feel free to take that class. Even though it has the same number, it's, it counts as a different credit for electives. OK, so that's how you implement this code using the future task. So you can see future task is kind of a funky little beast that can have very particular semantics where you can do computation in one thread and then wait for that computation to finish in other threads, which is exactly how we used it here. So if you read Brian Getz's excellent book, uh, Java Concurrency in Practice, he talks about this stuff. You can read it in text form. I kind of spoke to it and highlighted the code. Um, but interestingly enough, this was such a common idiom that they decided to make changes to the concurrent hash map to add support for this exact use case. So the good news is, if you're programming with Java 8 and you're using the concurrent hash map, then they build in this new capability that alleviates the need to write the future task code that looks like this. So if you have code like this, which is what we had before for the future task, you can now replace this somewhat clunky code, even though it works, it's kind of clunky, with a call to compute if absent. And what compute if absent does is it basically does what we see here. It goes ahead and will look the key up in the map concurrently. If it finds it, its value has already been computed, it gives you back the value. Otherwise, what it does is it runs this lambda expression or method reference or whatever you pass here. And uh, it goes ahead and does this computation. So in this particular case, we can essentially get the same effect that we did here just by putting that behavior into the code itself. So compute if absent will do all the stuff that you see in there, except it does it 
built into the concurrent hash map rather than you having to write this code with a future task. So if you take a look at this blog article, it'll explain a bit more about some of the new features in concurrent hash map, and, and one of the key ones is uh, Computef Absent. There are some weird kind of quirks with Computef Absent, but um, the way that we're using it here works just fine. OK, so that's the end of the discussion about future task.